how great is God's amazing grace? How big is God's love for us? You know, that's a question we'll never know the answer to because we will never come to the end of God's grace and God's love. This morning, we're going to look at three people who experience the grace of God and then look at how the grace of God works in our lives as well. We will also be doing communion this morning, so you may want to pause things for right now and go get the elements that you prefer to use for communion because that will come up later in the service. It is my hope and prayer that you are blessed by what you see here today and that God would work through this medium to give you wonderful blessings. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus calls us from the distraction of our hurried lives, saying, Come to me. Christ speaks to us in the comfort of our settled lives, saying, Follow me. We are among those who have heard the call and have dared to respond to Jesus. We have been changed by his love and now desire to walk faithfully with our risen Lord and serve him in the world. Let us worship God who has called each of us as his disciples.
Our New Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were closed, and though his eyes were closed, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision that a man named Ananias comes in and lays his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. The Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He immediately, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Oh,
Today's gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of John. Um, it's after the resurrection, and the disciples have gone up to Galilee, and they've been fishing but not having a lot of luck. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging a net full of fish for they were not far off from land, only a few hundred yards off. And when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same thing with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The Word of God for the people of God. You know, other than Jesus, for me, the two most interesting people in the New Testament are Peter and Paul. They were very alike in many ways, both headstrong, both firmly committed to the work of God. Both were highly gifted people, but their gifts differed very. Paul had a very keen intellect, and today scholars still discuss his work. Peter was open to what God was going to do, as was Paul. They were both, in many ways, trail setters. Peter, the first one to reach out to Gentiles and to bring Gentiles into the fold of the Jewish followers of Jesus. And Paul, who then built on that and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ all over Asia Minor, which we call Turkey today. They were very different in other ways, but... They were both called to the to faith in Jesus. And at the core of their faith experience, they had known the grace of God. And we see that today in both of these stories. Peter, you remember, had denied Jesus. Denied him three times. Denied he ever knew him. He did it when he was standing by a fire. And I wonder, I wonder if smelling the charcoal on the beach and looking at Jesus, if he had a memory of that night when he was standing by the fire and denied Jesus. He who said he would never betray Jesus learned a hard lesson that day. Paul actively attacked the followers of Jesus. He held people's cloaks when they were stoning Stephen, and then he went on a rampage to wipe out all the followers of Jesus doing so in the name of God. Both Peter and Paul had checkered past when it came to their relationship with God. One had let Jesus down 
at the worst possible time, the moment of his arrest, and the other actually attacked the followers of Jesus. And both experienced God's grace. In the story from John, Jesus takes Peter aside. Now imagine what Peter must be feeling. The fire might have reminded him of that night when he stood by the fire. And Jesus, I, I, I see in my head, Jesus, come here, Peter, I need to talk to you. And Peter comes over and he kind of feels like he's been sent to the principal after acting up in class. And now he's going to have to pay whatever's due for what he had done. And Jesus looks at him and he says, do you love me? Well, Peter does love Jesus. And he says so. You know I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then he asked again, Peter, do you love me? And again, Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Now, Peter may be thinking it's all over by now, but Jesus asked him again, do you love me? And Peter, this time, the, 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 the John tells us he felt hurt. Why do you ask me this three times? I've told you, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. I do love you. I do love you. I do love you. Three times. Three times he's asked. Three times Peter denies Jesus. And three times he experiences the grace of Jesus as Jesus says, do you love me? That, that soothes over the troubled waters that we had. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Three times Peter denies Jesus, and three times Jesus asks Peter to affirm his love. This section is often called the restoration of Peter, because in spite of his denials, in spite of the fact that he must have felt withdrawn from Jesus at some point, because he kind of disappears after the resurrection until this point right here, Jesus had never withdrawn from him. Jesus reached out to him in love and lets Peter affirm his love for him three times. Peter might not have been able to deal with the shame of denying Jesus, but Jesus overcame that with his love, with his grace. He never stopped accepting Peter. Now, it's different for Paul. Paul was, um, Peter was a follower of Jesus, and he had just denied him. The author of Acts tells us that Paul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He thought of himself as a devoted follower of God, and as a devoted follower of God, he thought the best thing he could do for God was wipe out all the followers of Jesus, because Jesus was clearly heretical, and anybody who believes him needs to be done away with. And he's headed to Damascus to do a big persecution of the church. He's got names. He knows where to go. And boom, he's knocked off his horse and blinded. Now, God probably knew what Paul needed. Paul was as headstrong as Peter was. And he was going to do what he was going to do if he felt it was right. And there was nothing you could say to stop him. And basically, God hits him with a cosmic baseball bat, and Paul's lying down blind. And Jesus, and God, Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? By the way, at this point in the story, um, his name is Saul. At some point, without any warning, he changes his name to Paul, and he's known the rest of the story as Paul, which is confusing for some people who didn't know about the change. I was leading a Bible study once. We were studying this passage, and somebody raised their hand, and they said, who is this Saul guy? Well, we, he learned he was Paul, and later for an assignment, he had to write Paul a letter, and he says, dear Paul, why did you change your name and not tell us? Anyway, Paul's laying there, and he says, why are you persecuting me? Now, that got Paul's attention. It probably needed to be something that big to get Paul's attention. And Jesus doesn't leave him there blinded, knocked off his horse. Now, I, I got to be honest. If people were going around persecuting the members of this church and I could do something about it, I don't know if I would be as gracious as Jesus was to Paul. I would be angry. I wouldn't 
kill anybody or anything, but I would be very angry. Well, Jesus sees Paul persecuting his people, and in that he sees beyond Paul's actions into who Paul is. And he decides he's got a task for Paul. He's got a mission for Paul. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And, and then he just doesn't leave him there. He sends them to the house of a man named Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus and who knew all about Paul, knew Paul was out to wipe out Christians, and he's not crazy about having Paul on his house. But again, there's a reconciliation that goes on there, and God says, I'm in charge of all this. And Paul is taught the way of Jesus and then becomes a follower of Jesus. Again, God's grace reaches beyond Paul's actions and into the heart of who Paul really was. Now, these stories don't just happen in the past. Now, they're great stories. I love reading about them, but they're, they're, these stories happen on a regular basis. Kathy has just sung Amazing Grace, a beautiful version of, of Amazing Grace. And most of us know the story. John Newton, who wrote it, was a slave trader. And God opened his eyes. He stopped, slating trade, stopped trading slaves. And he wrote Amazing Grace. Well, there's a lot more to the story than that. So Newton was born in 1725, and his mother wanted him to be a pastor, but she died when uh, John Newton was just six years old. He was raised by a father who was a captain, but he was always going to sea, so he was sent out to an aunt who mistreated him. And at the age of 11, he was able to join his father as an apprentice on the boat. And his seagoing career would be marked from the beginning almost to the end by a headstrong disobedience to anyone in authority. He's kind of like Marlon Brando in those movies, in that movie, The Wild One, where somebody asks him, hey, what are you rebelling against? And he says, what do you got? Well, that's, that's the way John Newton was. Um, and he, he had this period of coming to God and then backsliding, repenting, backsliding, repenting, backsliding. He wanted to be good for God. He wanted to do right for God, but then he would backslide. And finally, he just said, I'm done with this. I'm done with this God stuff. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to go back to God anymore. I'm done. And after that, there's no stopping him. He becomes unmanageable. He's so disobedient on the ship that he's on that they drop him off of the naval ship and he's pressed into the British Navy. And while he's in the Navy, you know, it is said, um, you know, cursed like a sailor. Well, apparently Newton was so great at cursing, he could make sailors blush. He wrote obscene ditties about the captain, which made them all laugh, but not the captain. And the captain actually sells him into slavery in the country of Sierra Leone. And he's a slave of the Africans. Well, his father comes and gets him, and um, he goes out to sea again. And from that point on, Newton becomes a slave trader. He worked on a slave ship and uh, eventually had his own ship. Um, on one of the visits, on one of the, the voyages that they had, there was a strong wind blowing, and they weren't sure the ship was going to survive. It was being tossed to and fro, water coming on. And Newton says to the captain, I've got an idea. We're going to go down here, and I've got a, a way to bilge the water out while the ship is still turning. And then he turned back to the captain, and he said, heaven help us if this doesn't work. God save us. And he goes, and in fact, it did work, and they were able to save the ship. It took 11 hours that he was doing that. And during that time, he thought about those words that he had said to the captain, God help us if this doesn't work. And they started rolling around in his head. Now, at the same time, there was a woman on shore that he dearly loved. And um, he got permission from the father to write to her, but the father made it clear he wasn't crazy about Newton writing to her because he had heard about his reputation. He had heard about his propensity to disobedience. He had heard about his incredibly foul mouth. And Newton said, said I want to marry her and I will change my life. 
Well, he started by changing his life with, by giving up the swearing. And slowly and slowly, bit by bit, other, other habits begin to develop in his life. And before he knew it, he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But he was still working on a slave ship. He was still trading slaves. Um, at that time, most Englishmen, Christian, thought that slave trading slaves was an okay thing to do. It did not separate them from God. And Newton did that until finally he collapsed on a ship and was taken back to shore, never got on a ship again. Well, when he's on shore, he's trying to cast about for what he's going to do, and somebody recommends him to be a priest. And he's appointed to a church in a place called Olney. And while he's there, he runs into a, a friend of his, William Cowper, and they have great theological discussions, and they decide to start um, an evening Bible study, and they said, wouldn't it be great if we could write a hymn for every single Bible study? And they did. And one of the hymns that Newton wrote was Amazing Grace, um, which he actually had called a study of righteousness according to Chronicles something something. Um, it, most scholars believe that it was as he was writing that hymn that he became convicted of his role in trading slaves. Because soon after that, he becomes a full-blown abolitionist and teams up with William Wilberforce, who was the man who put an end to the slave trade in England. The song, as we know, just, just took off. There, we don't know what the early tune was. The tune that we now sing that we're familiar with is an American shape note tune called New Britannia. And um, it's possible that in Newton's thing, they just recited the hymn. I, nobody really knows for sure. But it, it became a song that rallied people. And I think because it was really about God's grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Peter could have sung that song. Paul could have sung that song. We can sing that song. If God can reach through the actions of these three men and change their lives, forgive them for what they had done, bestow grace upon them, how much more can God bestow that grace on us? How much more can we experience that grace for for most of us, our sins are not as great. Probably none of us ever had anything to do with the death of a Christian. None of us ever traded slaves. But what we have done that we may be ashamed of before God is overcome by God's amazing grace. It was true in the first century with Peter and Paul. It was true in the 18th century with John Newton and it is true today in the 21st century as God bestows his amazing grace on all of us. Amen. I just spoke about God's amazing grace. And a table is a sign of reconciliation. A table with food on it is a sign of reconciliation. When people had enemies and, and they, they wanted to do a peace treaty, they would do it over a meal because that was a sign that whatever 
they had against each other, they were going to let go of and become allies once again. We come to this table and we bring to this table many things. We bring our gifts and our talents and our loves and our passions. And we also bring the things that we might have done that we should not have done. And yet, God is at this table. God invites us to come to this table. God makes this a table of grace so we can experience the love of God. So please, in your own way, in your own homes, come to the table of grace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, our Creator. You have given us life and second birth in your spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claimed Israel as your chosen nation and raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection, breathing into it your life and power. From worlds apart, you gathered us together. When we go astray, you welcome us home. Always your love has been steadfast. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, God of, of power and, and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and the cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body to the world. By your Spirit, Unite us with Christ and one another until we feast with him and with all of your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night of his betrayal and arrest, Jesus was eating with his disciples he took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, he said, you proclaim my death, until I come again. This is time for you at home to partake of the elements that you have chosen to use for communion. The bread of life. The body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's blood shed for you. Thanks be to God. O oh Lord, we have just ate bread at your table. We have just drunk from the cup at your table. Be with us now and gather us together as we experience your grace in our lives. May we also be gracious to those around us. As you have forgiven us for the, the worst things that we might have ever done in our lives, so may we forgive those around us, even of things that we may think are unforgivable. It is hard. It is very hard to forgive. It cost Jesus, it cost you your life. And yet we live that out as representatives of the kingdom of God. We live in love and grace. And so, Lord, instill in us a passion for forgiveness as you also instill in us 
a passion to be forgiven and to know you and to love you. We now pray for those in our community who need special doses of your love. Lord, we think of Elizabeth's brother Mark as he's preparing for yet another reconstructive surgery on his foot. For Mike Mahan's mother, she's in rehab following the amputation of her lower leg. We pray for Nancy Zitzner's friend, Ginger, worn down after battling cancer for nearly 15 years. For patience for Hugh and, Aunt, Hugh and Tina's son, James, and his family as they continue to endure the limitations of living in lockdown in Shanghai, China, for well over a month now. We pray for Christopher Funk, Mark, Pete and Mark's son, discharged now from the hospital and receiving care back home in Cheyenne, Wyoming, for his wife, Tanya, who's also suffering from bone cancer. We thank you, Lord, that Carol McKenzie's grandson, Aaron, is out of ICU and recovering at home, that Carrie Pike's granddaughter, Christina's cancer is responding to therapy, that Sue Silva's cousin is recovering at home from a double lung transplant. We thank you, Lord, as this wet spring lingers, every day bringing a bit more rain, soaking the ground, that the irrigation season will possibly last a bit longer. We thank you that at higher elevations, the snowpack continues to build. We thank you for the way you have worked in our community, among us, in our people, and in our lives. Truly, bringing us to you, calling us, making us your disciples. And we, as disciples, we pray the disciples' prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now this is the time for you to think about your gifts to God. And I don't just mean money. If you want to make a donation to the church, you can do so online. You can mail us a check. But what else are you going to give to God this week? What of your own gifts and talents? What of your time? What of your abilities? Which of your passions are you going to give to God? We are all pulled into God's wide open arms by incredible love that God has for us. May you experience that love in your lives. May the love of God fall upon you like a soft summer rain. May the grace of Jesus Christ surround you like the air you breathe. And may the power of the Holy Spirit work in and through you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.